Thank you, Nick. Um, as we focus on the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ and the great celebration of the angels and of his good news, we also celebrate the fact that a great aspect of Christmas is family. Many of us, when it comes Christmas time, are very much affected by family memories. We remember growing up, we remember certain things about Christmas time, we remember maybe cookies and hot chocolate, we remember waiting and waiting and waiting and trying to peek under maybe a corner of the wrapping paper to find out what we were going to get. Uh, we remember some good times going out shopping. We may have a lot of great memories, family memories that we spent time together in our homes and, and with our loved ones. And Sometimes also, Christmas brings with it family memories that are not so warm and so pleasant. Christmas is a time of struggle for some people. It's a struggle when someone you loved is gone, when they're missing, and you feel their absence more painfully at Christmas time, perhaps, than at any other. It's a, an awkward time for family at times, because for a good deal of the year, you can avoid family members if you're not that wild about them. If there are relatives you'd rather not see or who would rather not see you. But Thanksgiving and Christmas sometimes bring family members together again who haven't been seeing each other too much. Um, it's pretty awkward, for instance, um, if somebody in your family is kind of embarrassing. Maybe they've committed a crime or spent some time in prison. Uh, maybe they're just uh, known for something that's not really exciting for you and so you really don't like hanging out with them very much or being associated with them or having people even know your relatives and then at Christmas well you're kind of shoved together again and uh, you have these awkward silences you're not quite sure what to talk about you may even heave a sigh of relief when it's over so Christmas has a way of of bringing out a lot of the the most touching and wonderful family feelings and also some of the most difficult, whether the grief over ones who celebrated past Christmases with, her, with us and aren't here to celebrate it this year, or the, just the tensions that exist in family which are hard to ignore at Christmas time. And Christmas has a lot to do with family. We well understand that. And it does also simply in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ. I mentioned that sometimes Christmas is awkward if you've got relatives that you're embarrassed about or if you've got relatives who think that you're kind of weird and blowing it. And there are a few of you here whose relatives think that. Whether, whether it's on their side or yours, I won't evaluate here, but we've got that. The fact is, you can kind of choose your friends and you can't choose your family. You're just stuck with them. But Jesus could choose his family. And the remarkable good news of Christmas is that he chose us. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2, both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family so Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. A good many of us have a relative that we're not exactly bragging about or broadcasting about, but the Bible says Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. And when I think about that amazing statement that Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters, that he's made himself our brother, it is amazing that he would choose us. When you begin the New Testament, one of the first things, in fact, the very first thing you get is a family tree. You read Matthew chapter 1, and it has a whole bunch of begats if you're reading it in the King James. Um, so-and-so begat so-and-so, and you get these lines of names of people who had others, and it has all the excitement of reading the phone book for a good many of us. Um, you read that genealogy, or you read the genealogy in the early part of the book of Luke, and you get... Uh, a lot of names, just name after name after name, and you might just skip past it, you might yawn a bit. The fact is, actually, I know of a Hindu person who was converted to the Lord by reading the genealogies because it was rooted in history and real people, not floating somewhere in a spiritual cycle of reincarnations in the spirit world only, but the Word became flesh in a particular line of people. 
And when you read those genealogies in, in Matthew, the very beginning of the New Testament, you find that list of names, but the beginning of that list of names is Abraham. And the big three, it, it kind of tra traces from Abraham to David, from David to the time of exile, and then there's a time of exile up to the time of Christ. And those three big segments are there, and, and you find some names in there um, that aren't all that good. But one of the things that impresses me about that is simply that Abraham lived 2,000 years before Jesus came. We live 2,000 years after Jesus came, and it just gives you a sense of the vast history of God's great plan and how this one story that we celebrate is part of a much bigger story of people that God has been putting together. And if you go to Luke's genealogy, it goes back not just all the way back to, Adam, or back to Abraham, but all the way back to Adam. And it has, you know, the Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God, it says. Um, God, gave, God had a son by creation whom he called Adam, and Adam blew it big time. And so God decided to send, and not just to send, but to become a second Adam. You've heard the old saying, if you want it done right, you've got to do it yourself. Well, God decided to do it himself the second time around, and he came as one of us. And he chose to not just make the human family, but join the human family, and he is not ashamed to call us brothers. When you read those genealogies, you see Adam and Eve with everything given to them, and they choose the one thing God forbids. And you read on through that genealogy, and even someone like Noah, who is a righteous man before God in many respects, and God saves him from the whole devastation of the world. And one of the first things you read that Noah does afterward is he gets blind drunk, and one of his kids is making a mockery of him. You read onward, and you have Abraham, who by that time, he and his family are a bunch of idol worshipers, and God plucks them out of their idolatry. You read on in the genealogies, and you come upon Jacob, and Jacob is somebody who lies to his own father to get his blessing, cheats his own brother, is constantly scheming to rip off his uncle. He is one sneaky snake. And you keep reading. And the first woman you read about is Tamar, who um, had a child by Judah. And she was actually married to three of Judah's sons and wasn't able to have a child, so then she seduced her father-in-law in disguise, and he was only too willing. So that's how one of Jesus' ancestors came into existence. And you read onward in that genealogy, and in, in Matthew's list, it's just a name, Rahab. You get a little more Old Testament detail. She's a prostitute who's a pagan idol worshiper who gets brought into the family of God and into the family line of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have David and Bathsheba, and one of their children goes on to be in the line of Jesus. And they were, that child was the result of an adulterous union where Bathsheba's husband Uriah was murdered. And on and on it goes. This is the family line that Jesus chose. We can't choose our relatives. He chose relatives like that, relatives like us. And why? Well, in Romans chapter 8, verse 3, it says that he came in the likeness of sinful men to be a sin offering. He came for us. And you read those genealogies, and not all of those are uh, family to be proud of, and yet Jesus is not ashamed to call them and us his brothers. When Jesus came into the world, it was announced that the Son of God was born, but the remarkable thing was, what's the sign going to be? You have these angel choruses in all their splendor and in all their majesty, and they say, now here's how you're going to recognize him. And they don't say he's going to be there in a blaze of light and glory or with songs of power. They say, you're going to find a baby wrapped in rags and lying in a feed box. And that's how you're going to find God come to earth among us. He's going to be a little poor baby who is not ashamed to call us brothers, who's willing to become a baby just like everybody else. In fact, a baby um, who's made like his brothers in every way, says Hebrews a little later, except for sin. He's someone who has our blood running through his veins. Even today, Jesus has human blood running through his veins, 
He's one who had human tears running from his eyes. He is not ashamed to call us brothers. That's what I mean by a family Christmas. Jesus is our brother and God is our father. He came in to the human family in order that we might become part of his family. He came into the earthly family so that you and I could be part of the family of heaven. And just think about it. From all eternity, Jesus was not without family. He had his eternal father. And as the Son of God, forever loved by the Father, Jesus enjoyed all the joys of heaven, all the bliss of enjoying uh, the union with His Father and with the blessed Holy Spirit, surrounded by beautiful angel creatures that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit had made. What a family Jesus already had! And He dived into our mess and wasn't embarrassed to do so. What a thing it is that he would come from that family. He would not hold on to equality with God, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And that's what the scripture says Jesus does on Christmas. He becomes one of us. Well, why, why did he do it, and what did that involve? He had the same human nature as we have, as I've said, physically, the same blood running through his veins, tears, he grew up a baby in diapers, all the same stuff that you and I grow up with. In fact, the people who knew him growing up had a hard time believing he was anybody special because he was so much like everybody else, except, of course, for sin. But other than that, he was as human as anybody else. Um, there is a, a minor heresy embedded in a way in a manger, I think. Little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. Uh, how else do babies let you know they need food? Uh, I'm pretty sure little Lord Jesus did some crying. That's one area where uh, the songs don't match the scriptures. Jesus was like us in every respect, including the tears, the diapers, and, and everything else. And also the same experiences. When you think about the Lord Jesus Christ, he was born um, in a situation where they were oppressed uh, under an occupying war power. Many of us don't even know what that's like. The fact is Jesus not only became like us, he, became, he came into a much worse situation than many of us have to live under. They were living under the boot of the Roman Empire. From the moment he was born, Jesus was hunted by the evil King Herod, who was a puppet of the Roman Emperor. And Herod tried to kill him. Jesus spent some of his first years as a baby and as a little boy living in Egypt, very far from his family's right home. He grew up as a refugee. People in our world who live under cruel armies, who are oppressed by brutal dictators, who've had to become refugees and flee to other countries, who are unwanted immigrants in the lands where they find themselves. Jesus knows what that's like because he's been through it. He grew up in Nazareth in, in a poor person's home. By the time he gets to adulthood, we never read about Joseph anymore. It is almost certain um, that Joseph died while Jesus was a boy, um, or at least as a young man. So if, if you're a child who's lost a parent, he knows what that's like. I don't know what that's like. My parents are still living. They're both 84. My dad was 17 when his dad died. I don't know what it's like to lose a parent that young. He did. Jesus knows everything that we've been through. Some of you have loved ones right now. Um, who are hovering between life and death. Jesus knows. He knows what that's like. Um, some of you have loved ones who have wandered very far from the Lord. Jesus broke down crying over Jerusalem and said, I just wish I could take you in and you knuckleheads aren't willing. He knows what it's like to have ones so dear to him who are just so blind and stupid that they won't come to God. He, he knows all of that from the inside. He's not just the master of the throne room of heaven. He knows our griefs. He carries our sorrows, and he knows all that. And, and why? Why does Jesus enter into our nature and all the experiences of being part of our family, our messed up, painful family, our family that's under the reign of death and brokenness? He does all that for a number of reasons. One, uh, several of them are stated right in that same passage of Hebrews 2 where it says he's not ashamed to call us brothers. He says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery to their fear of death. He entered into our family because we needed somebody to stick up for us. We needed a big brother. 
We were getting bullied and we couldn't handle it. Some of you know the story of the three billy goats gruff. And they want to get to this pasture with all this fantastic grass. And there's just a small problem. There is a bridge over a river and there's a nasty troll under the bridge. And if anybody wants to get to the grass, they're going to have to get past the troll. And who's going to deal with that stinking troll? Well, the little goat, he, he wants to eat the little one. The little one says, well, wait for my big brother. You'll find him a little tastier. And then the, the medium-sized goat heads across and says, well, wait, wait for my big brother. He'll be really tasty. And then the big brother shows up, and that's real trouble for the troll because big, big brother is just too much for that troll, and he smashes him, and that's it for the troll, and they go on and enjoy the green pastures. There, there's a good bit of gospel in the, in the goat's gruff because there's one who's not ashamed to call us brothers. And when the devil comes after us, you say, well, I think you maybe better take this up with my big brother. And... The Bible says the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. That's what it says in 1 John. Here it says he took on our flesh and blood so that by his death he would destroy the one who holds the power of death, the devil. The devil's favorite weapons are sin and death. And Jesus entered into a a sin-cursed, death-ridden world. And then he took all of our sins into his body on the tree and died that terrible death. And the Bible says that on the cross, he made a spectacle of the principalities and powers, of the evil demonic powers that were arrayed against us. And he frees people who all their lives are held in slavery to their fear of death. One of the great Christmas stories is not just the one where we have the shepherds and the angels and the manger. Another great Christmas story is the one where we have the dragon. If you read Revelation 12, that's a Christmas story too. And there's this great and terrible dragon with a bunch of heads and horns and and he's bloodthirsty and he's waiting for a woman to give birth and he wants to devour that baby up. And it's a picture of Satan all through the Old Testament times just wanting to swallow up the promised seed. God had made that promise to Eve that one of her offspring would destroy the dragon, the serpent. And on and on you you read where all the baby boys of Egypt are, are to be destroyed by the Pharaoh or where Haman wants to wipe out all the people of Israel and they're saved by Esther, or the wicked queen Athaliah had wanted to wipe out the whole line of David, but one little boy survived. And so you read again and again of attempts by this dragon to destroy the seed and never succeeding. And in Revelation 12, you have the woman finally gives birth to the child and the dragon wants to swallow it up, but the child is caught up to the throne of God. And then the dragon is frustrated and utterly defeated and angry. And that's a picture of Christmas. That's what happened when that son who was promised to be one of us was born. And he defeated the devil, the one who holds the power of death. Satan is too strong for you and me, but he is not too strong for our big brother. Some of you have big brothers who aren't perfect like Jesus, and they like to pick on you, and they maybe tease you and do this and that, but I have found that if Somebody else comes along and thinks they get to pick on you. Big Brother will say, no, that's my job. (laughs) And Big Brother will look out for you and maybe take on the person who's trying to pick on the little brother or sister. And, of course, Jesus is not a big brother who likes to pick on us in that same way, but he will stand up for us in that same way against the enemies of those who are his family. So one reason that Jesus comes and takes on our flesh and blood is that he might be the one who will be our representative, the one who stands up to Satan on our behalf. Another and even more central reason is that he might represent us before God. Hebrews 2 goes on to say, For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. The Son of God became flesh and blood, because we needed somebody to deal with our sin problem. He couldn't become an angel and take care of that for us. He couldn't become an animal and take care of that for us. Hebrews says the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. It had value only in pointing to a much greater sacrifice. It couldn't be an angel or an animal or anything else. He had to become one of us to deal with our problem and to take our punishment. And so in becoming one of us, he becomes the brother that represents us. 
That's why on, when he was announced to Joseph, he was told, you must name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And that's why the angel said, to you is born a Savior who's Christ the Lord. He's one who came to save. And above all, not just to save us from the devil, but to save us from our sins and from the wrath of God. And he had to do that in a human body. And so he became human and suffered in his humanity the, the penalty, the punishment for all our sins when he died on the cross. That's what's involved when he's not ashamed to call us his brothers. He becomes one of us and then deals with all of our problems by taking them into himself and suffering the punishment for all that. So our brother deals with the Satan. He deals with the sin that afflicts us and, and all the guilt and the penalty of it. And so again today, you know, Christmas is not just about those warm and fuzzy family feelings or those irritations that we might feel in family settings. Christmas is about Jesus solving the problem of the whole human family, the sin that afflicts us all, the death that we all must face. And he did that by dying for us in our own nature as a human and then rising again as a glorified human who then glorifies all who else who are also going to be raised in him. And that's the good news, that when those people are missing around that Christmas table this year, they are seated at a much greater table in glory with the one who came for their salvation. And then there is family companionship. When you have a birthday celebration, uh, it may be nice to look at baby pictures for a couple of minutes of that person back when they were a baby, but really, let's face it, birthday parties are about celebrating a person and who they are right now and enjoying their company right now. And we celebrate that Jesus became one of us because he's still the one who walks with us and is still our companion. Some of you um, have an older brother or sister, and yeah, they have their downside and their irritations at times, but they also have their advantages. Because sometimes you have a brother or sister who's been there before you. They had to take some of those math classes before you did. And they can kind of help you out with something that maybe even your parents can't explain to you very well. They're a little closer to your situation and they can help you get it a little better. Or maybe you've got one who's been through driver's ed and now you're learning to drive and you get a few tips from an older sibling. Or, um, well, if you have an older sister, they might teach you to shop. I sometimes wish they wouldn't do that, but you know, they, they teach you various things. You, you pick up various things from older siblings because they're, they're a few years ahead of you and they can help you out. And, and so it is with our Lord Jesus Christ. We have someone who has been through what we've been through. Hebrews says, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. And that can refer to being tempted by sin. It can also refer to being tested by trial or hardship. The, the Greek word there can mean either one, a, a testing or a tempting. And later on in Hebrews 4 it says, we don't have somebody who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. We have one who was tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. He's been through the things we've been through, as I was mentioning earlier. And so we have a big brother who's gone ahead of us. We fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the pioneer. He's the one who goes ahead of us. And he shows us how to deal with the various things that come at us in life. And he's our companion so that we don't have to feel we're totally alone in that. Hebrews says you can go to the throne of grace and find mercy and help in your time of need because the one who's your great high priest is there. He went there ahead of you. He came down to earth and now he's gone through the heavens and he's the son of God and you can go to him with boldness because he's not ashamed to call you his brother. He's not ashamed to call you his sister. His father is not ashamed to call you his child. In fact, he tells us to pray to us, to pray to him as our father in heaven. He's, he's the head of our family. Jesus has done all of that on Christmas. He has made himself one of us to be our companion, our friend, our helper. The good news of Christmas is that Jesus is not ashamed to be called our brother. The bad news of Christmas is sometimes we're ashamed of him. That's the craziness that still exists in human sin and wickedness is that we 
sometimes don't want to be associated with him or linked with him or we're mad at him or whatever it is that keeps us from embracing him. But then it is a time again to hear the good news and to let our hearts melt in the light of God's love. Jesus came to pour out the love of God on us. Above all else, Christmas is the revelation of God's love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. That's what the Bible says. Sometimes we're ashamed of him. We run from him, and he runs right after us. And he's running after us again today. He came into this world on Christmas, and he comes to us again this Christmas, and he won't let us get away that easily. Some of you, perhaps, have been wandering far. Why don't you just cut it out? Why don't you just say, hey, you came after me. I think it's, it's time that I stopped running from you. You have a lot of reasons to be embarrassed about me, Lord. I have no reasons to be embarrassed about you. And so I'm going to follow you, and I'm going to love you. He's not ashamed of us. Let's not be ashamed of him. He is glad to have us in his family. Let's be glad to be in his family. And as we do, remember the family status and the privileges that he gives. We are his treasured possessions. We are holy and dearly loved. We are his beloved. The Bible tells us this, and that's the very word of the living God. So listen to God's love, and that message of love today is born to you a Savior. He is Christ the Lord, and he is not ashamed to be our brother. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for including us in your family. And we pray, Lord, that as you are making us holy by faith and by the work of your Holy Spirit, we will delight more and more in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ as one of us, that we may be glad for the liberation from the devil and all his powers, that we may be glad that we are reconciled and brought together and made friends and family of God once again, and that in all the trials, the griefs, the heartaches, and the tears of life, we have one who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses, who is ready to help us in every trial. So, Lord, on this Christmas again, help us to receive all the delights, the blessings, the gladness of family and of salvation and of the good gifts, the tasty treats, the wonderful presents, all the good things of creation as well as the good news of the new creation. Help us, Lord, to delight in all these things as members of the families that we're part of here on earth and also members of that great family of God and that mighty family, the eternal family, the union of the Holy Trinity forever and ever. And may that love, Lord, shine from us again in this season. For Jesus' sake, amen.